We've heard from so many of you frustrated, wondering how many people aren't paying to ride the light rail. Now we have data that gives us something of an answer. First, the Recall Polis Fund transferred a bunch of its contributions to another fund run by the same organizer. Now they're giving away some of the money raised to oust the governor as gifts. Next is back at work finding all the errors on street signs around town. I bet public works crews love us. Maybe they ought to just start making more signs like this. They'd be easier to replace. That's next. So there's a question we get asked constantly on this program when we talk about RTD's light rail. People want to know how many people get away with not paying their fare. We just stumbled on some data that answers at least part of the question. I've taken light rail plenty of times without being fare checked including this afternoon when I was trying to get video of a fair check for this very story. Many of you have had that same experience, which leads to the same question. How many people are riding light rail without paying? We see about two to 4% fare evasion on light rail. Each quarter, RTD's security agency reports to the board how many people are checked and how many people didn't present a fare. In the second quarter of this year, more than 400,000 passengers were checked by transit security and nearly 10,000 of them didn't present fares. It works out to be about 2.16%. So how much money is RTD losing? Well, it's really hard to calculate because we have so many different fares. So you could apply that percentage to what we collected. Last year on light rail, we collected about 62 million. 2.1% of that is a chunk of change, about $1.3 million. On the other hand, commuter rail trains like the A and G line barely see any people skipping out on fares. Of the 1.5 million people checked in the second quarter of the year, only about 1,000 of them hadn't paid. 0.6%. You'll notice they check a heck of a lot more people on commuter rail, and it's because of a federal safety requirement. On commuter rail vehicles, we do have fare inspectors on every vehicle. Still, 10,000 people in three months who hadn't paid for their light rail fare may have you wondering, why doesn't RTD just do the turnstile thing like they do in other cities? Well, if you look at our system, it's not like a subway where there's an entry point. So it'd be really expensive to add turnstiles and lock, as I say, lock down the, the area. So what happens if you're caught without a fare? RTD says first it's a warning, then it's a citation that ranges from 80 to more than $100, depends on where you're caught. That money goes to the courts and RTD does not get any of it. And the third time, they will ban you from RTD for a month. Well, people who donated to the official Recall Colorado Governor Jared Polis Committee, some of those donations are being used as gifts, being paid to three of the group's own board members. The expenditures were first reported by Marianne Goodland with our partners at Colorado Politics. Shane Donnelly, the Polis Recall Committee's organizer, got $5,000. Lisa Pasco, the committee's secretary, received $3,000. Renee McGill, the Recall Weld County leader, uh, she got $3,000 or $3,000 gift. So the chair of the committee, Julie Andra Fuentes, hasn't responded to our request for comment about those gifts. So the last time Kyle spoke with Fuentes, she defended a decision to transfer $29,000 in funds to a new, new committee, Colorado for Trump, which is also under her control. The Trump campaign said it would take appropriate action over the misleading use of that name. Fuentes said, she would stop only if the president called her personally to ask her. We don't think that he's called her. Uh, also, uh, we don't think he's going to call. Uh, as far as the expenditures go, the Secretary of State's office says it cannot say if the committee's actions were illegal. The office would investigate if a member of the public files a complaint. Well, much like a marijuana user waits for the edible to kick in, the marijuana industry has been waiting to use banks and credit cards like a big boy business. It only took six years for Congress to act on a bill that would do just that. Lucky for us, our Lori Lizarraga works a bit faster than Congress. The future is green. So the yeas are 321, the nays are 103. Wednesday, the U.S. House of Representatives came to terms with that. The rules are suspended, the bill is passed, and without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. A bill that would give legal marijuana businesses access
access to banking passed with just about every Democrat saying yes, along with almost half of Republicans. So we're real excited to see banking move forward. It's taken way too long. Wanda James was the first female and minority marijuana business owner in Colorado. We do a billion dollars worth of sales each year in Colorado, a, well, more than a billion, a billion plus. And she can't just hide a billion dollars under her mattress. But the way it is now, she's not allowed to put those profits in a bank. We're hoping just to be treated like a regular business. In an industry that has been legal and lucrative in Colorado for almost six years, it feels overdue. This is Patty. Patty Salazar is the executive director of DORA, the state agency that regulates businesses like Wanda's. Yes, the Safe Bank Act has been a long time coming, which is why we're very excited to see positive momentum in it moving forward. Positive momentum that's taken six years, and it's only one third of the battle. It still needs to move on to the Senate and then on for final consideration for signature by the president. It still has to pass in a Senate that is majority Republican and be signed by a Republican president. So there is bipartisan effort to push this forward. Um, we're hoping that the Republicans want to play ball and given this political landscape that we're in, man, a lot of us need a lot more cannabis. <laughs> Now, you might be thinking, I thought Republican Senator Cory Gardner had a marijuana banking bill. Well, he does. He has proposed a similar bill in the Senate and also supports Perlmutter's bill. The Senate Banking Committee chairman told Perlmutter's office they expect to take up the cannabis banking legislation this fall. So there's still time to get everything all sorted out. We'll see. All right, Lori, thank you. Our next question comes from a viewer named Tony. He's confused as to why Elliott Street is spelled with one L for about three miles in Denver, but one small section of that street near Mile High Stadium is spelled with two L's. Fair question, Tony. We reached out to Denver Public Works to ask why the name changes there on that small stretch of Elliott near Colfax. City officials searched their addressing system and told us nothing came up as an Elliott Street with two L's. So they're now submitting a work order to get that sign changed. Oops. Aurora's late mayor was a man who dedicated himself to that city, a city that is growing quickly. So he started the 6th Avenue project, Parkway project, to ease the commute for people who move there. Unfortunately, Mayor Steve Hogan did not get to see that project through. He passed away from cancer in 2018 before the construction began. But city officials knew his dedication is what made that project possible. So when it was time to drive the first wheels east from the city, they knew it needed a special tribute to the man who made it possible. So the 6th Avenue Parkway is now the Stephen B. Hogan Parkway. He was so, so instrumental in getting this to be a priority in the city. And uh, uh, it, just, it just seemed like a natural when someone suggested that, that we should absolutely do that. He had a great vision for what the city could look like in the future. And he saw early on that this connection with our uh, existing part of the city and the growth area. The Stephen B. Hogan Parkway connects the existing 6th Avenue Parkway east of Tower Road to E-470. It took about a year to complete. Mayor Hogan served Aurora from 2011 until his passing in 2018. We want to give kudos to the Colorado Sun for highlighting an interesting way people are getting mental health help in Boulder. It combines mental health services and primary care, all under one roof. It's an idea that seems simple enough, even obvious, but it took a while for that to become reality. Our Anusha Roy explains what the holdup was. For nearly two years, um, headaches, heart palpitations, um, hypotension. Gina Manchego was desperate for answers as to why it felt like her body was turning against her. Muddled through it for two years. Um, I was sleep deprived. My diet sort of changed. Then her primary care doctor at Boulder Community Health made a different kind of suggestion to go to a behavioral health specialist, in particular, Julie Youngman. Trying to investigate together whether or not anxiety symptoms actually could be the culprit. It was. And what's different about this is that Manchego didn't have to leave this complex to get help. I didn't have to get referrals to different places, see if uh, different practitioners were taking my insurance. Boulder Community Health has been expanding this integrated practice for several years, marking an important shift. So having it embedded in primary care, I think, has takes away a lot of the stigma that I think still exists. So it's a lot easier to come to your primary care doctor's office yeah. um, to access 
um, counseling. Especially since that's where so many people first go when they aren't feeling well. Uh, we, we see probably primary care, we see about 30% of our practices are um, for behavioral health issues. The way that we've managed healthcare for so long doesn't make a lot of sense. That helps explain why it took so long for this change to happen, according to Ben Miller, the chief strategy officer at the nonprofit Wellbeing Trust. Yeah, well, we have a fragmented culture that's treated mental health so different from medical care that it's taken a lot of time to figure out how to do it. So you got to think about how we finance care, how we policy care, basically all the things that go into creating more of an integrated unit. We haven't figured that out yet. So there are more than 300 primary care facilities who worked on similar prog programs across the state. This was through the Colorado State Innovation Model. The doctors at Boulder Community Health there, they said they loved how this treatment was working. They really want to continue it. But Miller said that ultimately for the rest of these clinics and hospitals, it's going to be up to them if they're going to continue providing that kind of integrated treatment service for their patients. So when I think about something like this, I think about insurance because mm -hmm. oftentimes people struggle to find if their exactly. insurance covers this provider or this provider. How do they sort all that. Yeah, so ideally the people who love this program would like it to not cost anything extra. At this point, it really just kind of depends on what your insurance coverage is. And nationally, there has been some movement for insurance companies kind of warming up to this idea, getting on board with this, but uh, that work is still being done. And at least at Boulder Community Health, the patients are not having to pay anything extra at this point. All right. Anusha Roy, thank you. Most people look to the future, but one man likes to look behind him. We're all concerned with the future, but you're not going to arrive there unless you have an understanding of the past. He gets paid for it as Colorado's new historian. It's a sign that could use a makeover. Adams County says it's working on it. Next. Here's a sign that is pretty sure to get the point across here. It says, Welcome to Adams County, a handwritten cardboard sign that is as nice to look at as the scenery that surrounds it. Next viewer, Josh, spotted this at 74th and the I-76 frontage road. Adams County officials say that's actually property that CDOT is responsible for, but they cleared the sign and some of the trash anyway, and they've notified CDOT about the trash they weren't able to clean up. Share the signs you spot using the hashtag HeyNext or email them to next at 9news.com. Well, it was another hot one today. 89 officially out at DIA, 15 degrees above where we should be for this time of the year and just one degree shy of that record set back in 2010. We still are in that top spot for the warmest September ever on record here in Denver. The winds have been quite gusty in and around the foothills. The high country berthed past about 52 mile per hour wind gusts. These are going to continue overnight as we're tracking two storms, one to our north that's bringing some snowfall into Montana, a secondary system that's sitting across parts of the desert southwest on the north side of that we're seeing a bit of cloud cover pushing in here to the Denver metro area and a few isolated showers going further out to the west. We shouldn't see much rain tonight. We're down about 50 degrees. We'll keep it mild here for the eastern plains and even up in the mountains in the 30s and 40s. Future cast looking pretty quiet tomorrow morning. A front pushes in and then by four or five o'clock few isolated showers firing up not only in the mountains but also here across the plains. So keep your umbrellas close by tomorrow. Here comes that front pushes in overnight brings us the scattered showers, but really the biggest story is going to be a nice cool off tomorrow. Daytime high sitting in the low 70s, a huge break from what we had to deal with today. 60s and 70s going up in the mountains, but unfortunately it doesn't last long. We're back to an above average weekend in the 80s with some sunshine out there. Windy conditions heading toward early next week before Steve another cool off arrives by Tuesday and Wednesday. That my friend will finally feel like fall as we welcome in October. Good. I'm ready for it. Me thank too. You, thank you, Danielle. Mm -hmm. Knowing where you came from is essential if you want to know where you're going. That's why the Colorado State Historian wants to keep us informed about the past of the Centennial State. Here he is with a bit of his own history and what his new position means for Coloradans. That's what you wanted to know, right? It's my office. I live here. I probably spend more time here than I do anywhere else. I'm William Way professor of history at the University of Colorado at Boulder. And I have been appointed uh, the Colorado State Historian. To the extent that there's official title, I guess that's it. You know, I, you know, I think they gave me a piece of paper certificate that, that has those words right on it. It is important to have one individual, but actually you need more than one individual. You should have 
many individuals. In our case, we have five individuals who serve on the State Historians Council uh, to ensure that the understanding of uh, Colorado's past is an accurate one and that it is uh, told you know, to the general population. I was trained in modern Chinese history. When you study modern Chinese history, you end up studying overseas Chinese. The Chinese were instrumental in building uh, the Central Pacific Railroad. Uh, the railroad was very important to the development of Colorado because we had access to the Transcontinental Railroad. We had therefore access to the rest of the country. I think history is uh, very important. It provides people, if you will, an understanding of where they came from. It also gives them a glimmer of what, uh, where they're headed, who they might actually become. We're all concerned with the future, but you're not going to arrive there unless you have an understanding of the past. His desk look like, looks like mine, except he has a better reason. Dr. Wei's stint as state historian lasts one year. After that, the State Historians Council will choose another appointee to keep part of our past top of mind. There's a small house in a large Denver park, and it raises a lot of questions. You can't help but go by there and say, why is that there? What's it doing there? Who lives there? What goes on in there? And he's just the guy to answer him. Next. There's a small house sitting in Washington Park that has a big story to tell, a story that people often ask about when they're hanging out in the park. But right now, park goers are fenced off from history because the house was one of the casualties of the bomb cyclone back in March. To this day, no one can get into this home, including the Denver Parks and Recreation team that works inside. Now, since you can't go in and ask, we decided to learn its history from a man who knows it well. The Eugene House in Washington Park is one of our most treasured landmarks, and I was sorry to see it clobbered by a tree during that snow cyclone earlier this year. I'm Tom Noel, a professor of history at the University of Colorado at Denver. Eugene Fieldhouse is a great story in preservation. It was originally like something like 300 West Colfax Avenue downtown, the heart of Civic Center. Molly Brown herself, the unsinkable Molly Brown, was worried about it when they were building Civic Center Park. That cottage was in the way. It was going to be demolished, but Molly Brown, who was a great fan of Eugene Field and his poetry, said no, and she paid to move it to Washington Park, where it was made a branch of the Denver Public Library. Eugene Field was a journalism who traveled around quite a bit, came to Denver to work on the Denver Tribune. And he didn't really stay here this long. He was hired away by a Chicago newspaper. So he was only here a few years, but made an indelible mark, left some of our finest poetry about Colorado places and Colorado history. Right next to the house is a sculpture, and uh, it is a model for his most famous poem. Winkin', blinkin', and nod, one night sailed off in a wooden shoe, sailed on a river of crystal light into a sea of dew. Denver Parks and Rec says they are in the process of repairing the historic home. They hope to start work in about a month and they, have, and they hope to have Eugene Fieldhouse reopen early next year. A quick round of your feedback coming up next. Hearing from a lot of you tonight about RTD's light rail and people that you think may not be paying the fares. One thing RTD wanted to remind folks is you got to remember as people are boarding the light rail, they might have prepaid fares, either passes or on their phone. So keep that in mind. We'll see you next time.